History is a nightmare that we should wake up from. This is why for the last 40 years, I've been writing, researching, lecturing, and teaching so that the present will not read like the past. Our lecture today is about the past and how we understand it. It will talk about Ferdinand Magellan and Lapu-Lapu, who's celebrating 500 years next year. In December 2019, five Filipino historians participated in a symposium in the Sociedad Geográfica de Lisboa with a deceptively innocent title, Magalhães, Magallanes, Magellan, simply by positioning Portuguese, Spanish, and English forms of a 16th century explorer's surname, the forum underscored not just matters of language and translation, but on a deeper level, the question of viewpoint in history. Different points of view make for an engaging and challenging history, as historians try to make sense of conflicting and conflicted primary sources to reconstruct a past from incomplete data, mere traces of a past that cannot keep still. How is Magellan remembered in the Philippines today? Three cities in the Philippines are bear the name Magallanes, the largest in Sorsogon with 34 barangays, another in Cavite with 16 barangays, and another one in Agusan del Norte. In the Manila, we actually have Magallanes Village, which is located at the southern end of Metro Manila. It has a metro station. It has a very busy highway interchange. It has a commercial area, a church, and even a gated community whose street names refer to the Magellan Expedition. If you go to downtown Manila, you will see Magallanes Drive. It's on the side of the Pasig River, beside the Manila Post Office, and refers to a Magallanes Monument, a former city landmark which was erected in 1848 that was destroyed in the Battle for Manila in 1945 and has since been replaced by another marker to Legaspi and Urdaneta, which actually marks the beginning of the Spanish colonial period. The Spanish period does not begin with Magellan in 1521. It begins with Legaspi in 1565. Over in Cebu, we have the cradle of Christianity, and therefore we have a coral uh, monument which contains Magellan's cross. Nobody believes or nobody should believe that this is the original cross. It's actually a replica. But folk people believe that it is the real one that Magellan planted there in 1521. And it is supposed to be miraculous. It can give you children. And it's supposed to grow two or three inches a year, which is why it's supposed to be going all the way up to the roof. Although I've calculated 1521 to 2020, if you calculate, the cross should have gone way past the roof. Anyway, in nearby Mactan Island, there is a shrine that is believed to be the spot where the battle was fought. We have here two markers. We have a Spanish marker, which was built in the 19th century, that commemorates Magellan and the glories of Spain. And we have a newer marker with a statue of Lapu-Lapu. It's a post-war Filipino monument to Lapu-Lapu that in the absence of reliable historical record on what he looks like, he has been imagined and reimagined into this handsome, gin-toned man who will not look out of place in a bench underwear ad. For 2021, the National Quincentennial Commission is building a new monument that will hopefully 
give us not only a new way of looking at Magellan and Lapu-Lapu, but also generate new meanings in our history and the way in which we understand the past and look to the present. The new monument will replace the sorry one that I visited many years ago. It has a historical marker on it. And in this historical marker, it's put in a place and it looks like a tombstone. Uh, if you read it, it talks about Lapu-Lapu and how Lapu-Lapu beat Magellan in April of 1521. Now, if you do not visit this monument, you will not realize that there is not just one, but actually two markers in the shrine. And you will see here that these markers actually show us not just history, but it shows us a change in viewpoint, a change in paradigms that we have to understand. Behind the Lapu-Lapu marker, you will find another one, a longer one, that talks about Ferdinand Magellan's death. It talks about how Magellan circumnavigated the globe. When you put these two markers in context, you will find out that one, the Magellan Monument marker was put up in 1941 when the Philippines was still a commonwealth. It, we were still a colony. And the 1951 that talks about Lapu-Lapu defeating Magellan is a marker that was installed when we became a free and independent republic. Now, these markers tell us how we should remember the past. And it is something that continues till this day. In 2018, President Duterte talked about how we should stop thinking about Magellan and we should focus on Lapu-Lapu, who is our hero. And in that 2018 remarks, he actually even mentioned that it pains him to think that the grouper, the fish, is known as a Lapu-Lapu in the Philippines and that this is a fish that we kill, cook, and eat on a daily basis. And that is the way in which we remember our heroes. But our problem is that Lapu-Lapu has no solid historical basis except for the name. We have his name in manuscripts by Antonio Picafetta, who did not flesh it out by giving details into what he looked like, what he was like, or you know, even a sense of how his people remembered him. So in these things, we actually have to imagine. And in the void that is left by no historical record, we have reimagined Lapu-Lapu. We like to think of him as this beautiful man, always shirtless, toned, beautiful black hair. The history recedes into wishful or aspirational images of a hero that appears in monuments, a hero that appears in comics, a hero that appears in stamps, and even in movies. There's one in a teleserie, and just recently, there was an advertisement for disposable baby diapers that showed Lapu-Lapu. It was very controversial, but again, people prefer a mythical Lapu-Lapu who is young, beautiful, and muscular, and not the 70-year-old man described by Danny Hirona, a historian who says that during the time of the battle, Lapu-Lapu was actually 70 years old and was probably not in the, in the water at all. But when we look at our memories, we look at the way in which we are taught, even in the Ayala Museum, we see Magellan and Lapu-Lapu fighting in man-to-man, one-on-one combat. Uh, there's a yearly commemoration of the battle. This is uh, uh, shown again. We see them in comics. And when you look at the Filipino depictions of it, of course, in Filipino depictions, we always win. Uh, Lapu-Lapu is always the winner and the dead people are always Spanish. But if you look at European depictions of the same event, you will see that in this European woodcut, for example, the natives are always half naked and everyone else is wearing armor. There is another one where the, Lapu, the Mactan warriors are wearing feathers in their hair. They're beautiful and toned, just as tall as the Europeans who are all wearing armor. When we went to Lisbon last year in the Geographic Society, there was a stained glass window which was dedicated to Magellan. It's supposed to talk about the different explorers of the Age of Discovery. And in this stained glass window, we have a depiction of the Battle of Mactan 
where the Mactan warriors looked like African natives because the artist was Dutch and had no idea what people in Mactan looked like. But my favorite of all the depictions of Magellan's death comes from the New York Public Library, and it shows Magellan being killed not in the water but on land, and he's being killed by being crushed on the head with either a stone or it looks like a coconut. So the victory of Lapu-Lapu or the death of Magellan are two sides of the same coin. And we see that this contentious reinterpreting of our history is not new. It started all the way in 1890 when Juan Luna the painter was doing a painting of the Battle of Mactan. And he wrote to Rizal and he said, what should I call this painting? Should I call it the death of Magellan? Or should I call it the victory of Lapu-Lapu? We do not have um, Rizal's reply, but we are sure that being a Filipino, he would probably say, let's do Lapu-Lapu. But again, Luna was more pragmatic because he realized that, you know, uh, in Europe, they'll know who Magellan is and they'll buy the, my painting. But if I call it Lapu-Lapu and be Philippine, no one will buy the painting. So we don't know what would have happened to that painting. But in the Cebu capital marker, we see the interpretation of that history that glorifies the death of Magellan as a blow for freedom. We also see this in the Mactan marker where Lapu-Lapu is described as the first Filipino to repel European aggression. But the problem is there was no Philippines as we know it till 1543 when the islands of Samar and Leyte were called Filipinas. And there was no Filipino as we know it today until the 19th century. Now, the recent controversy erupted over an animated film, Magellan and Elcano, whose point of view was bashed by Philippine social media because Lapu-Lapu was depicted as a villain in the story because it is told from the Spanish point of view. Now, if you care to look at the IMDb website, which talks about all films, you will find that the original title, because it is Spanish, is El Cano and Magallanes because Magellan did not complete the voyage. The rest of the voyage was made by a Spanish explorer named El Cano, who is often forgotten. Now, El Cano the Spaniard appears in the Spanish title. Now, in Portugal, they don't like Magellan. So the title is just An Adventure in the Seas, the First Circumnavigation. No mention of Magellan, who is considered a traitor to his country. But in the Basque country, Elcano goes at it alone. The title is Elcano's First World Tour. So when you see this, you will see that nothing is innocent. Everything has a point of view, even an animated film retelling the first circumnavigation. The different country logos for the 500th anniversary show not just restraint, but good design and how an idea is conceptualized. The Spanish and Portuguese designs are very, very bare, and uh, they just tell us about an idea, an idea of exploration. Sad to say, the Philippine logo is the most wordy and the most literal. And uh, in it, we downplay Magellan, and we focus on the introduction of Christianity and the victory in Mactan. Now, in 2019, before the Magellan Symposium in Lisbon, the five Filipino historians were photographed for a Lisbon paper. And we were brought to the monument to the discoveries where Magellan is begrudgingly included. After the pictorial, I walked around and I saw on the ground, there was a map of the world. And when I look, of course, when you see a map and you're abroad, you look for the Philippines. So I looked at the Philippines and the shape of the Philippines was there, but it was not named. All that was named there was Palau, the Molucas, and Timor, which were Portuguese territories. So that's why, since the Philippines was Spanish, it is not in their history. In the afternoon, in the Geographic Society, I saw a big map with uh, the roots of all the Portuguese explorers. Now, it's a very interesting map because when you switch off the light, the, the, the roots become luminous and you can see uh, where the Portuguese roots went. 
And when I looked and I followed the Magellan expedition, I saw that it came halfway around the world and then it stopped in the Philippines. From there, it does not continue to the circumnavigation because after Magellan's death, it is taken over by a Spaniard. So when you look at this, you really see how history can include and can exclude. How is a Filipino historian supposed to look at the past, supposed to look at Magellan and Lapu-Lapu and that part of our history? When I write my history of the Philippines, I will not write that Magellan discovered the Philippines because when he got here, there were already people here. So to say that Magellan discovered the Philippines is to propagate a Western Eurocentric viewpoint. When I write, I will also not follow Gregorio Sides' lead that declares that Magellan merely rediscovered the Philippines, for that is the rabid nationalist Filipino viewpoint. Now, I will not even ask, as my students did once, whether we can be counterfactual and say that maybe the Philippines or the islands discovered Magellan. When I write my history, I will simply state that Magellan arrived in the Philippines in 1521. It's a paradigm shift. You can see how that word changes. You have discovered, rediscovered, arrived. How one verb will color the way in which we see and understand the past. So when we see this, it is something that is very simple. You will see that history is a conscious act of remembering. But we must be reminded that history is not simple as it seems, that it is never innocent or objective because history always has a point of view. History can be used to include and exclude. History can be weaponized to marginalize certain people or sectors of society. History can imprison people in views not of their own making. So the questions we must ask ourselves in relation to this part of our story is, will we use history to unite rather than divide? And lastly, do we remain imprisoned in the past or liberate ourselves from history? Thank you.